This morning I have the great honor of speaking to you about building trust and restoring trust in relationships. I grew up in a home that wasn't safe. When I say it wasn't safe, I mean there was no vault, no confidentiality. And if, someone, if something was said, I could guarantee before the day was over that the news would have spread. And it took me a while, but soon I no longer shared important things about my life with my family. And so when I say to you that trusting others and being trusted is something that I hold as a core value and strive for daily, you must know that I've had to work diligently to become a safe person, someone to be trusted. Every day, with everyone we come in contact with, we are either building trust or destroying trust. The words I speak are like threads, and they weave a tapestry called relationship. And when we demonstrate trust, a beautiful tapestry is made. And when we break trust, the thread is broken and the tapestry weakens. In January, the small group that I facilitate began a Bible study entitled, What Are You Afraid Of? The faith development team had taken a poll last summer to see what was foremost in our congregation's minds and hearts. Fear topped the list. This small group examines the many areas of fear in our life. In this last session, we've been looking at the fear of being disconnected. And one of the most common ways we become disconnected with others is through infidelity. Someone not being faithful to us. Now, we often hear the word infidelity and we think of marriages and a partner being unfaithful. But we have all been unfaithful at one time or another with a friend or a family member. I'm guessing at this very moment, you can bring to mind someone who broke trust with you and the relationship became disconnected and fractured. In the second book of Timothy, chapters 4, verses 9 through 18, Paul, one of the great followers of Christ, is in prison, and he speaks of being deserted by those he had discipled and called friends. He not only names those who deserted him, but he tells of an individual who, quote, did me a great deal of harm. Paul says, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. The very ones who Paul counted on couldn't be trusted, and he became disconnected and isolated. We all know the pain of a broken relationship. This entire month, we are exploring what it means to be in biblical community. Two Sundays ago, Pastor Rick said, love is an action, it's a verb. It's a choice we make. He shared that the relationship we have with Christ influences how we do relationships with others. We were invited to speak these words to one another. You are God's loved child. Well, today, I want to share from 
my personal experience. Ways that we can not only build trust, but restore trust when a relationship is broken. The first way that we can build trust is with honesty. I spent the first half of my adult life being a people pleaser. And as a result, there were times when I was less than honest because I didn't want to disappoint or hurt someone's feelings. I didn't want to make waves and I avoided conflict at all costs. But what I found is that if I can't be honest with someone, there's only a certain level of depth to our relationship. When I withhold honesty, in a way, it's being inauthentic. And trust can't be built. It takes courage to be honest and speak the truth in love. <coughs> Authenticity. Being authentic is another way to build trust. You know, we have this inner wiring in us that alerts us when someone is not being authentic. And I can't really put my finger on it, but I can spot someone who's inauthentic. And when that occurs, my trust level with that person is affected. You know, I have to ask myself, how authentic am I with others? I mean, if people only see the happy face, is that really being authentic? A couple of months ago, I received word that a friend had died. And I was devastated by the news. And the next day was Sunday. And I could not pretend that I was okay. I wept and was comforted by you, my community. And then someone made the comment later that they were surprised to see me so emotional. And for a minute, I became embarrassed that I had showed that emotion. And my first reaction was to think, wow, I won't do that again. And then I thought, wait, this is my community. Where else can I be authentic? This is my safe place. I will not suck it up and put on a facade when I'm in pain. So trust is built with honesty and authenticity. Building trust also requires accountability. Accountability with those we are in relationship with. You know, my understanding of accountability has changed over the years. I used to understand it as being under someone else's authority and rules. Well, in, in part, that's true. I mean, as children, we're accountable to our parents and, and teachers. We have accountability in this church and, and in our workplace. And sometimes accountability can be misused and abused. What I'm talking about is holding one another up to a standard that honors God and each other. Accountability values respect and it's mutual. I cannot build trust without accountability and respect. Have you ever heard the term relational rent? I wrote these words the other day, and 
Immediately, a friend's name came to my mind. Someone who I've journeyed with for a long time. And recently I've had this sense that this person has not been honest with me. And I think I had subconsciously avoided having a conversation because it had the potential of impacting our relationship. And then I wrote the words, relational rent. And I could no longer avoid the awkward, difficult conversation I needed to have with my friend. I called and we spoke. And it was awkward and difficult and painful. But I have been a trustworthy friend. And I have proven over the years that I love my friend and want the very best for my friend. So I have to hold them accountable if I am who I say I am. It would be dishonest and inauthentic of me not to speak truth, even at the risk of damaging our relationship. This accountability is not a one-way street. I have, to, I have to be willing to hear words of challenge from my friend as well. You know, sometimes we can't see the truth ourselves. And we need someone we trust to hold up a mirror for us and reflect back to us what we are saying. I did not speak in judgment, but in love, because I want my friend to be all that God has created my friend to be. I want friends like that in my life. Building trust also takes humility. Pastor Rick's message last week challenged us to be people who exude humility. Jesus modeled a life of humility. The fourth chapter of James in the New Testament is a beautiful recipe for submitting ourselves to God and to one another. You know, we have it backwards in our culture. Our tendency towards self-absorption leaves little room for humility and trust. <coughs> trust also needs to be vulnerable. As C.S. Lewis once observed, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Wrap it up carefully, round with hobbies and, and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your, self, of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe dark, motionless, airless, it'll change. It won't be broken, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and hard. I have navigated through a broken relationship with someone very dear to me. The circumstances aren't important, but the outcome is that our relationship broke. And it was a dark, dark time for me. And the fracture was so severe that I didn't think it was replaceable. 
or repairable. And I was sad, and I was angry, and I felt betrayed. I out to God to fix it, and nothing changed. There was a wall between the two of us that felt impenetrable. And I began to become cold and hard. One day, I read this psalm, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse of a mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds those who trust in him. <coughs> Reading Psalm 32 made me realize several things. You know, sometimes when we use scripture to change everybody else, but we must use scripture to change us, or else we will never be transformed ourselves. I had allowed my worth to be determined by my friend's approval. And when that approval was lost, I lost my sense of self-worth. I had to detach my value of myself from my friend's approval. What happened to me is when I withdrew from my friend. I also withdrew from other relationships. And initially, this was an important step because it caused me to still myself before God and ask God to fill the hole that only God can fill. But eventually, I had to make a conscious effort to lean into those relationships where trust was strong. I needed my core of trusted friends to keep me relationally healthy. I had to will myself to remain connected to those people even when everything inside of me wanted to disconnect. I learned a lot about myself during that dark time. And one of the most important lessons 
was that I had to take responsibility for my part of the brokenness. I wanted to blame. We want to blame someone else when we're wounded. But the goal is not to blame. I had to take responsibility for my part, and when I finally acknowledged that I had also wounded my friend, the work of forgiveness began. It had to begin with me. Because I'm the only one I'm responsible to, God for. God's word to me was that I needed to initiate the restoration process in God's strength. I didn't feel the love, but I had to act in love. Both people must want to restore the relationship in order to repair trust. But that being said, I knew that even if my friend was not willing to work on restoring our relationship, I was still going to forgive. In other words, my friend could choose not to forgive me, but God forgave me. And I could choose to accept that forgiveness from God and forgive my friend. Restoration is a process and it takes a long time to restore trust once it's broken. But it will never happen unless we humble ourselves, become vulnerable, take a long look and a deep look inside, and become honest with our own brokenness, and forgive. I had to let go of my right to be right. Resting in God's mercy and grace. This is where my sense of worth comes from. We mistake that and we place our value in what others think of us. And then we're disappointed when they can't be all that we need them to be. I read these words the other day from the book Monastery of the Heart. Community is the backdrop against which we do what we do. It gives us the underpinning that enables us to go on when we are tired, to go forward when we're afraid, and to go more deeply into the unmasking of ourselves when everything inside of us seems to have gone to stone, goes dry and dull and lethargic. Community building doesn't just happen. It cannot be taken for granted. It requires both great faith and great trust that is generated by a continuing display of great human care that begins with me and comes back to me. I would like to invite you to be still for a few moments and examine an area in your life where you have not allowed yourself to trust. Is God leading you to take action? Maybe there is someone who has betrayed you. And you need to restore the relationship. Perhaps you have laid blame for a broken relationship.
whatever has been stirred in you this morning, be still and allow God to speak. When you trust, there is risk. Risk of suffering, risk of loss, <coughs> risk of rejection. But without this willingness to be wounded on the deepest levels, there cannot be authentic relationship on the deepest level. We had the privilege of spending last weekend with some trusted friends. And one of the women shared a reading with us that seems appropriate to close our time together. Oh, the comfort the indescribable comfort of feeling safe with a person. Having neither to weigh our thoughts or consider words, but pouring them outright just as they are, chaff and grain together. Certain that an understanding hand will take and sift them. Keep what is worth keeping and blow the rest away. We stand as we pray together. Mm. Oh God, there is work to be done in our lives. You have given us this community so that we may have a safe place in a very unsafe world. Guide us and direct us and, and grow us so that we may trust you more fully and in turn be able to trust one another. And so when others see this body, 
they will know we are Christians by our love. We place our broken hearts in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.